Welcome to another Founder Wisdom Pod. We have Chris Pahuja with us today. He's co-founder at Pyramidal. He's a YC Winter 24 batch alum. Uh, he's into Neurotech. He's an ex-Google, an ex-Spotify, currently in London, UK, normally in uh, New York, building uh, his startup to the sky. It's going to be fun. We're going to talk about the brain today and the rocket ship Chris is building. This podcast is brought to you by podpire.com. That's my podcasting company. If you want to monetize the art of podcasting, turn it into a lead gen machine, make friends and grow your empire, you can go to podpire.com. It is also brought to you by Qualia. If you want to optimize your brain, haven't had my daily dose of Qualia yet, so my brain might be faulty on this pod, but I'm going to certainly pop two pills in less than two hours to get into flow state. Uh, Chris, nice to have you on. If uh, you want to tell us a bit more about yourself, Pyramidal, and everything that you've been up to, you're more than welcome to do so. Thank you for having me, man. Uh, that was a really nice introduction. Um, I'm Chris. I am um, the co-founder of Pyramidal. Um, Pyramidal is building um, AI foundation models. So um, the same way you have um, LLMs or foundation models that are trained on text, which is human language, we're building foundation models trained on brainwave data, so brain language, um, which is EEG data, uh, with the goal being to conduct neuro neurological disorder diagnosis in hospitals to be an assistant for doctors, a doctor is having access to a digital doctor through their diagnosis. But in the long run, also use it for drug discovery, for example, or um, consumer devices. You know, there is an expectation that consumer devices will be able to read brainwave data. So with our um, with our uh, model, they will be able to quantify what's happening in our brains. Like this is my focus time. My focus is ninety percent. You can actually quantify that, as opposed to know subjectively the way it is today. Interesting. Uh, very ambitious. How will you monetize that on the short term? Great question. I mean, selling to hospitals is pretty straightforward to monetize. Like, you know, it's a AI assistant tool for doctors, and those are popping up all over the place, like it's in cardiology, for MRI scans, uh, for cancer um, diagnosis. So it would be just a blanket uh, agreement with um, a lot of these hospitals. It gets trickier when we think of monetizing with clinical trials or consumer devices in the long run, just because nothing like this exists. So we truly don't know. What's the future vision of the company? Like, where do you see it in 10 years? Will you be involved in Neuralink stuff? Um, that's a really good question. Um, the future vision is, is to, you know, have a decoder for brain language and understand what's happening in our brains. So to serve as this intermediate layer between what's happening in our brains and what humans can actually understand. Um, now, there's many ways to do it. Neuralink is doing it one way, which is doing with brain implants and getting this really, really high quality signal and converting that into actions. Um, there's another way to do it, which is um, you don't need such high fidelity data. And, uh, you know, for an example, like computer vision back in the day, the idea was, you know, um, models can only recognize really high quality images, right, which is the equivalent of Neuralink deep in the brain. But over time, we start to realize that even a very pixelated image, computer vision models can identify a dog is a dog, whether it's super high definition or uh, very pixelated. So we want to be on the other side of the equation where you know we realize that recording brainwave through non-implantables is um, not the best signal, but with the good enough model, it should be able to decipher what's going on. That's the longer term vision. It's for everyone to be empowered with the knowledge of what's in our brain. So, for example, if I'm having pain, I want to be able to quantify that on a scale of one to ten as to how bad my pain is versus just being like I have pain. Um, so, yeah, taking control of the brain in our head, essentially. What did you learn about the brain at uh, Spotify and Google? Um, so, I didn't uh, learn about the brain at, at those companies, actually. So, um, Dimitri, my co-founder, who's also the CEO of the company, um, is has a PhD in AI and neuroscience, and he's been working on this problem for 15 years. Uh, he did his PhD thesis um, in this space. 
we met um, a couple of years ago um, when he was telling me about he's working on this problem. I had worked on a similar problem at Spotify, interestingly, because in, in music is also time series signals, the same way brain waves are. So content detection in music is similar to detecting stuff in brain waves. Um, so we started talking about it, um, started building from there. Um, I brought the business angle into the, and the product angle into the equation um, with him working on the tech and uh, learned about the brain over time. Now we have three doctors who are um, working with us every day. So learning more and more from them as to how this could work in the hospital system. What about the ability of music to influence brain waves, your moods, your states, get getting you in a flow state? I believe music's still one of the lowest uh, biohacking fruit uh, to get in the desired mental state. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a it's a really good point. I mean, you know, there's music is definitely like you know it's an obvious um reaction to how our brain reacts to it and how it you know especially with meditation music or focus music like it helps you get in focus state um so i definitely believe in all that um but the um, the what, what i really want to know in the future is by how much like is it you know is it placebo or am i actually in a flow state and if i am on a scale of zero to ten how much and like, you know, recently Apple patented, for example, uh, for the AirPods to have EEG sensors. So if they have that and you have a model like ours, you know, you can actually track that. So music, you know, is it really putting me in flow state and, and how much of a flow state am I in? How many more hours should I work knowing that I'm flow state is what's I think super interesting to me about the future. And brain waves, do you think that would be a stronger a uh, signal to track as data to see what's happening in our brain and brain waves. If uh, come correct me if I'm wrong, but the brain is uh, an electrical box, and every time a neuron fires, there's a wave being released uh, in some shape and form. Why do you think this could be a high quality uh, data vs like getting in the brain a la neuraling? Yeah, I mean. Um... So the data is relatively similar, right? It is uh, electrical brain data. Um, what Neuralink is doing is um, they're getting the highest fidelity data, which obviously you know any, anybody would want. It's it's pretty amazing. Um, but in order to get an implant chip into your brain that deep, is not a feasible solution for everybody. It's more uh, for healthcare reasons, um, unless you know someone figures out how to have um, a chip that, that doesn't go that deep, for example. Um, but the, the point is that when you build a model, like we're not building hardware, right? We're just building software. Um, and, and the model can be applied across whether it's implanted, it's you know it's just on the surface or it's um, not inside at all, it's, it's, it's external. So that's the idea. I mean, we are uh, agnostic of where it lands, but we're placing a bigger bet on it being in devices like earphones compared to implantables, at least in the next 10 year horizon. And how would you correlate that data? Because there's so many uh, different data pieces between brain waves that can get complicated. It must be like a an AI to classify all of that. How would you associate a specific brain wave pattern with the external environment and the stimuli? That's a really good question. Um, so, you know, um, noise in data, uh, you know, is, is not new, right? Brain wave data, especially like a lot of patients who suffer from neurological disorders have, like they wear 24 hours, they wear devices that track their brain activity. Um, so, you know, you can train a model just like a doctor is able to distinguish what's noise and external stimuli versus what's um, actual data. Now, the language of the brain um, is has very few words, for lack of a better term, in the sense that doctors have identified on the EEG, here's like about 100 to 120 things that means it's something happening. That's the pattern. So when we build the first phase of the model, those are the things we go after. So teach the model to know exactly what a doctor knows. That is, how do we filter out the noise? And how do we look for those things? That's why the healthcare piece comes into play. In the longer run, you want to start to fine tune the model to do things or find new words 
in the brainwave that we don't know yet. Like if I throw something this way, you know, what is um, being observed in my brain? And um, can I um, try to replicate that action? Um, so, you know, in the, in the longer term, we, we want to start to try to identify more and more of what the different patterns mean and how they correlate with each other that are not visible to the human eye. And why do most companies go after uh, diseases vs optimizing the brain? Is it the want vs need type of uh, problem and the money it can generate? Um, that's a great question. I, I think a few reasons, right? For sadly, the way the startup world works is um, for one, you have to monetize so you can continue raising money and you can be a viable business. And once you have enough of a revenue stream, you can start exploring more consumer use cases, which maybe as a bigger market, but some of these market creation initiatives take a very long time to realize. Um, and then the second reason is, especially with things that have to do with the brain and, you know, like I can make a claim that our software can be like X, Y, Z with the brain. Like not many people would buy it. Um, and, but, you know, selling in healthcare, being FDA cleared as a first step is a good way to build credibility um, of what it can do. Um, and then the trust translates into the consumer use case uh, down the line. Right. And then to my previous question about the external and the internal environment, could we think of smart glasses, for example, that could communicate with um, what your algo is uh, sensing, the external environment? Because I saw uh, medicines on your website. If you take a medicine, then how that affects your brain waves, how would uh, something external know that you've actually taken that that medicine, for example? Yeah, so I mean, um, the, the way we would measure for that is you would have to be wearing a hardware device that we would have to connect with that is tracking brain activity. Um, and then the software would be able to uh, track the changes in brain activity from abnormal to normal as you take the medicine. The idea there more so is you know, right now you go to a doctor, it's like, yeah, two pills for this and that's standard for no matter your weight, size, your body. So it's not the best way to, it's very subjective, right? It might affect you a certain way where you can actually start to realize what doses are needed for each individual person. Um, that's the idea. With the smart glasses, it's a super interesting point. That's another way, actually, some companies are experimenting to record EEG. So earphones is one, uh, which is like Apple experimenting with it and a lot of other startups. There's also glasses where the back of the glasses can actually record EEG activity. That's one way. Uh, Meta's Ray-Ban glasses, they patented uh, for future versions to be able to record EEG. So you it would always have to be a hardware that's tracking the same way as a Fitbit or um, you know Apple Watch or whatever. Right. And let's say Apple would use your algorithm. Uh, what would be the the nature of the deal here, would it be uh, multiples of tens of millions per year to uh, have your algorithm translate what these uh, brain waves mean so that it can show in the app, in the health app, oh, uh, you should be careful about this. Uh, what would be the nature of a deal with a big company like that? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's too far into the future. Um, so it's not um, something we're prioritizing at the moment. But I'll tell you, like, we wouldn't want to have a deal directly with Apple, right? It's it would, Apple builds ecosystem products, right? So Apple opens up like Apple, for example, the iPhone is one hardware, the AirPods would be another hardware and anyone can build apps on the iPhone. Anyone could be building apps for how to interpret brain waves. See, we can have multiple music apps. It's not just Apple music. So the idea would be to actually work with developers who want to create apps that um, do different things with the brain using the model. Same way people use like OpenAI's API to create apps on top of it. Um, so th I think that's how I envision it right now, but that might, you know, that might change. Uh, I'm not um, sure how that would go. So at health techs, I guess, or I don't know, like a uh, headspace partnering with like a smaller-ish company than, than Apple so that they could make sense out of that? What would be a, a, a model, a business model with them? Would it be a yearly subscription or um, pay-per-use? Yeah, usually like the way we're thinking about it or the way like, you know, it's, worked, it's with LLMs at the moment is it's it's by ping, like how many times you're pinging the model and what inference it's gathering. So 
that's a pretty scalable solution because uh, you know you actually end up offloading the cost towards the customer. Um, and um, I think that's a scalable way of doing it and of how we want to do it. Like if Headspace wants to, you know, if you're meditating, they actually want to track, well, what is the effect on your brain of that meditation and how calm did you actually get on some sort of scale? Then they could technically think our model uh, and um, they could, you know, we could uh, charge them for a ping until the number of things exceed their subscription. And then you could potentially figure out well, what is the upper ceiling of their space. How are you constantly testing on your side that the model works and is accurate and makes scientific sense? Um, so we have a few publications. Dimitri uh, created an MVP, uh, published on Nature Scientific Reports uh, early on to prove the concept. Um, now we're generalizing the model, so we're in the training phase. Uh, but we have, uh, you know, we have doctors who are part of the company um, who you know, are helping us fine tune the model for different indications and like what they see versus what the model seems should be exactly the same. Uh, so that's how we're doing internal tests. Longer terms, we'd want to do pilots with some of the larger hospital institutions. What is the best way to sort of naturally optimize your um, EEG waves? I know that there's some frequencies of music that some people to listen to. There's meditation as well like uh are you obsessed about your own eegs and how to get into into a flow state through optimizing them um so i mean you know eeg is just brain language right um so like it would for each person how to optimize it so it's, it's the question would essentially become how do we optimize our brain in general um and it would just depend different, it'd be different for different people. Like some people might get in the flow state with music, some people might work better with meditation. And that's why I think, you know, the models eventually have to be fine-tuned to the individual they're used for. Um, it's the same, you know, like the way Apple does face ID, it's like tailored to that person. It's just like a smaller model or uh, recent Apple announcements about uh, the new iPhone having AI for each user or personalized AI. Mm -hmm. um, that's the direction it'll have to go for each individual to know what it, how do they maintain their flow state. How will AGI potentially accelerate the race to having a bi-directional uh, Neuralink-like device? So really, really good question. Um, you know, when we were fundraising, we, we got this question a few times and Dimitri is passionate about this um, as well. But um, the way we see it is, you know, when there's AGI um, and machines get more sophisticated and brain models get more sophisticated, um, and there's like a neural link kind of device that's like running on a model like ours and there's AGI accessible, it could be like direct, you know, uh, upload onto the brain. So for example, uh, right now, when you wanna look for a question, you go onto a computer, which is the interface, you type a question, you get the answer and you feed it to your brain. But it's this external act of looking at a screen and doing it. But if the machine is in your brain, you could just think about it. Well, what is, you know, I want to know how to build like a car or whatever, you know, and the information to just directly be fed to your brain versus me externally looking at a screen to do it. Um, and I think at some point in the future, that would be feasible for sure, but the way things are going in your near tech. Um, so yeah, I think it, you know, it's, it's where the world is headed. Right. And what would such a world look like if some people have access to that device and some don't? And let's say that uh, the price access to such a device is a million dollar. Once you have it, you can generate $10 million per day because you have access to pretty much everything. You become sort of the AGI. Uh, what uh, kind of challenges would that bring to society? So, you know, we are very um, forward on AI ethics and neuroethics. Um, and, you know, like from our perspective, there has to be a lot of regulation around AGI and, and, and neurotech in general. Like neurotech is very powerful and it's untouched frontier. Um, so... 
from our perspective, anything we build, like, you know, we're going to, we're planning to have a pretty strong AI and ethics team so that something like that doesn't happen. Um, but, you know, we can't say for others, but the vision that we see and a lot of people in New York Tech see is, you know, we spend a lot of our time in gathering information uh, in general, and it's not the best use of time of how society should work. Information should be available equally to everybody, and then people should be able to do what they want with it uh, and spend their time on things humans are supposed to do um, versus like, like travel, like explore, uh, not gather information and, and work for a lot less because you don't need to put in that many hours because the information gathering part of the work is automatic. How's been YC for you so far? And what are your top objectives for the rest of the year? YC was great. It was a super cool experience. We were both in San Francisco for it. Um, you know, amazing to be around that many founders who are all building really, really cool companies, made some really good friends, really good connections. Um, we finished YC in May, ended up closing our seed round shortly after that. Um, and you know, the goal is right now to keep building and launch a version of the product to hospitals in the next six months. Um, so that's on the tech side. On the non-tech side, um, we want to be very tight on the product we're building, make sure it's built from the doctor's perspective, um, work on business development initiatives to convert those trials into actual contracts, um, and, you know, make sure we have a regulatory um, hold very tight. So it's really piloting and having those initial contracts over the next few years is to keep it up. Love it, Chris. Where can people find out more about you? Um, I mean, we have our website. If they want to learn about Pyramidal and, and uh, you know, people can reach out to us uh, directly from the website. If anyone wants to reach out to me directly, you can connect with me on LinkedIn or, or email me. It's Chris at Um And yeah, happy to you know, chat with you on the side of the screen.